It's an electrician under our desk. I know. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 17, 2022. It's 8.31 a.m. And this is the morning session of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Uh, happy St. Patty's Day to you. I mean, to celebrate. Um, we're taking up this morning H466, an act relating to surface water withdrawals and interbasin transfers. And um, we have a group of witnesses in to uh, help explain the bill to us, just so that um, members who are presenting to us, because of a uh, shortfall in time, we haven't had our formal walkthrough from Ledge Council yet. But uh, we do have the bill. We know the general ideas, and um, we'd love to hear from you. So, turning to our first witness, uh, Mr. Crawford. Good morning. He's just tuning in. Be right back. I left glasses. We're waiting for Mr. Crawford to connect. I think he's there. So, Mr. Crocker, can you hear me? Because I can't hear you yet. Okay. So, uh, yeah. We're live. All right. Well, Mr. Crocker, I don't know if you can hear us or not. I don't know if you want to disconnect and reconnect. And we'll go on to our next witness and then just come back to you. Um, although to be Yeah, he left, so he's probably going to try to come back. All right, we'll one more try, get over an electronic pickup, and then we'll move on to who's that fishing in the corner? Our second one. Pardon me? Who's that fishing in the corner? Yeah, who's that fishing in the corner? Looks familiar. I've seen that face before. Yeah, he's funny. Yeah, no, he's oh. still not showing here on the all right. <clears throat> we still have some troubles there, so let's go on to uh, um, Jordan Jonda, please. Good morning, Jonda. How morning. are you? Good. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I'm Jordan Gondi. I'm with the Office of General Counsel with Agency of Natural Resources. I provided legal assistance to the Act 173 study group um, about halfway through. I actually took over for our previous general counsel who moved on in his position. So was sort of involved at the tail end of the, of the study group and then helped the group uh, develop the the nuts and bolts of the, the bill H-466, which you have before you. Um, I don't have any prepared testimony today. Unfortunately, Jeff, who looks like maybe he is successful in his connection here, was, there he is, and to give a really helpful overview and summary of some of the issues that have arisen as of late. Um, and I'm happy to help answer questions about the mechanics of the bill or any um, legal questions you have. But if, if, if it's okay, I'll, now seeing Jeff's face here this morning. Of course, I figured it's always good to arrive with counsel, but usually you don't have to present the rationale for the, the whole thing. So thanks very much. Good to see you again. Uh, and good morning, Mr. Crawford. Glad to see you. Uh, the hiccups are over. Yeah, good morning, uh, Chair Bray. And I apologize, you have a few hiccups there this morning connecting. Um. So uh, yeah, if you could, we haven't, there was a scheduling uh, conflict that came up and we haven't had our usual complete bill walkthrough from Michael Grady. So I, if you could 
in your testimony uh, also includes sort of the bigger picture of what, what we're working on and why in the bill that would be really helpful. Sure, I, I prepared some testimony and um, I'll walk through it that, um, you know, discusses uh, means of H-466, but I'll be happy to answer questions as well from the committee um, on any specific portion of the bill. Um, so for the record, my name is Jeff Crocker. I'm employed as the Streamflow Protection Coordinator with the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation within the Watershed Management Division. In this role, I manage the Streamflow Protection section within the Rivers Program, which is responsible for reviewing the ecological impacts of projects and activities affecting streamflow and regulating these activities to ensure they are in compliance with the Vermont Water Quality Standards and other applicable rules and procedures. These projects and activities include review of dam operations and water withdrawals and diversions. Currently, Vermont does not have a specific permit or registration and reporting program for surface water withdrawals, nor does it have regulations specific to interbasin transfer. Therefore, the Streamflow Protection Section currently uses multiple regulatory regimes to address water withdrawals and diversions on a case-by-case -case basis. These regulatory regimes range from the using state's authority granted under Section 401 of the Federal Clean Water Act, the agency's environmental rules, other state permitting programs, and providing comments and recommendations for conditions as part of the Act 250 land use permitting process. The specific regime used to place regulatory conditions on operations of a surface water withdrawal largely depends on the use of the water in making and the infrastructure needed for the diversion. However, none of the current regulatory regimes specifically designated to address, none of the current regulatory regimes are specifically designated the activity of water withdrawal itself. And if a proposed water withdrawal does not trigger a jurisdictional threshold for a regulatory regime, no permit would be required. These non-jurisdictional water withdrawals are typically for, for surface water that are proposed to use pumps or hoses and do not require any infrastructure be built that may trigger another permitting regime. This may have significant impacts on Vermont's surface waters and the aim of H-466 is to first collect the data to understand potential impacts, and second, develop to ensure water withdrawals minimize the impacts of these public resources. As way of background, H-466 is the product of the work completed by the Surface Water Diversion and Transfer Study Group. The Surface Water Transfer Study Group was convened by the Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources as directed by Act 173, enacted by the 2020 session of the General Assembly. The study group was tasked to investigate and make recommendations regarding how the state regulates surface water and interbasin transfers and make recommendations to the General Assembly. The Surface Water Diversion and Transfer Group was a 10-member committee comprised of individuals representing a diverse range of interests including agriculture, non-government organizations, legislatures, and the commercial sectors. The Surface Water Diversion Group began its work in March 2021, meeting 10 times in December. The initial work of the study group entailed reviewing existing information on water withdrawal, current state laws, environmental rules and regulatory regimes for surface waters and interbasin transfers to understand where there may be current regulatory gaps. In determining whether and how to fill these current information and regulatory gaps, the study group sought input from the Vermont state climatologists, legal experts, and other state regulators. The study group heard from legal experts on water use law who have components of a regulatory regime that should be considered in any proposed part of any proposed regulatory regime, such as registration and reporting to get an accurate inventory of water use, establishment of a threshold for permitting, 
in registration, inclusion of minimum conservation flows, and a term limits on permits. Additionally, the study group heard from regulators from the states of Minnesota and New Jersey that administer surface water withdrawal and registration programs and permitting programs. While each pro state program was slightly different, each state program was similar in that it had a registration, reporting, and permitting component if the water withdrawal exceeded a certain threshold. Additionally, permit holders in both states are required to have contingency plans describing how they may access water needs <clears throat> during times of low flow or drought conditions. With this information, the study group had a series of discussions on how best to address Vermont specific situation regarding surface water withdrawals and inner basin transfers. Regarding inner basin transfers, the study group used the Killington Pico interconnect associated with the snowmaking system at the resorts as a case study. This is the only inner basin transfer known to be operating in Vermont, transferring water from the Ottaquichi watershed in the Connecticut River basin to the Otter Creek watershed in the Lake Champlain Basin. The transfer was reviewed by the agency for compliance with the Vermont water quality standards and other applicable rules and laws and issued as one water quality certification in 2019. The certification conditioned the operations of the withdrawals and the transfer to both protect the receiving waters as well as the donor waters. To review, reviewing the study group recommended to fill the existing regulatory gap with respect to interbasin transfers, that the agency be given the authority to review the transfer of water between watersheds with a hydrologic unit code of six based on the USGS classification system to ensure water quality standards are met. This review process would be similar to a water quality certification but differ in that would not be under section 401 of the Clean Water, Federal Clean Water Act. Additionally, the study group acknowledged that there may be transfers between small watersheds that may need to be reviewed for compliance with water quality standards. Therefore, the study group recommended legislative changes to provide the authority to the agency to review and require conditions for other transfers of water that may not be in compliance with Vermont water quality standards. These recommendations of the study group are captured in H-466. Further, to fill the gap for surface water withdrawals, the study group recommended a phase approach be adopted to address the current information and regulatory gaps. The first phase would be the development of a registration and reporting program to be administered by the agency to get an accurate inventory of the withdrawals and the quantity of surface water being withdrawn in Vermont. The recommendation of the study group is that all users that withdraw 5,000 gallons or more within a 24 hour period, register and report their water use to the agency resources on an annual basis. This is the first step to understanding the current quantity of surface water being withdrawn in Vermont and to develop a tool to ensure sustainable use of that water. The study group selected the threshold of 5,000 gallons of water to capture a wide array of potential water withdrawals while still setting the threshold high enough to exclude residents that may withdraw water intermittently to water their gardens or for other domestic uses. Additionally, the threshold was selected based on the fact that most of Vermont's rivers and streams are relatively small with an, estimate 70, with an estimated 75% of Vermont stream miles being in drainage areas of less than two square miles. These small streams can be more susceptible to excessive water withdrawal during low flow periods. Additionally, as recommended by the study group and captured in H-466, water withdrawals between 5,000 and 50,000 gallons of surface water within a 24 hour period would be able to estimate the total volume. And one way that could be done is by calculating the withdrawal rate or the capacity of the pump by the duration that operated. 
greater than 50,000 gallons within a 24 hour period would need to meter their use and report the total volume to the agency. No real time stream flow monitoring would be required. The second phase of the recommendation as captured in H466 is that the agency be authorized to develop a permitting program for the service. You're feeding out uh, water for to use information. Um, Mr. Here. Proctor, we sort of lost you in the last 30 seconds. I'm wondering if, if your connection isn't particularly good. If you just turned off video, we might the audio alone might come through more steadily. Want to try that? Okay. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I will turn off the video. Okay. So, all right. I'll start again. Um, the second phase of the recommendation as captured in H-466 is that the agency would be authorized to develop a permitting program for surface water withdrawals. The permitting program would use the information from the registration and reporting program and developed through the rulemaking process, which would set water withdrawal thresholds and requirements that would require a surface water withdrawal permit. Additionally, the rules for the permitting program would establish requirements as it relates to the efficient use con in conservation of surface water for sustainable use of, in Vermont, ensure that water withdrawals comply with the Vermont water quality standards, establish limitations on water, water withdrawals based on low flow or drought conditions, and require the development for alternatives to meet water needs in such cases of low flow or drought. Additionally, the study group recognized that existing users with water withdrawals need to be given time to come into compliance if a permit is deemed necessary. Therefore, H-466 states that an existing surface water shall not be required to obtain a permit until July 2030, as long as there's no increase in the water withdrawal rate or capacity of the water withdrawal system after January 1st of 2023. Further, the study group acknowledged that some sectors that rely on surface water withdrawal are already extensive, have extensive review processes and require, are, that are required by existing environmental rules. Most notably of these is water withdrawals used for snowmaking. It is not the intent of the study group to create another level of review for these projects but it is recommended that the proposals that are being reviewed as part of the environmental rule for water withdrawals for snowmaking be able to obtain permits under the surface water withdrawal permitting program. This approach would limit redundancy and create more efficient process for the regulated community and agency staff. In closing, I'd like to mention that there was a lot of discussion that occurred amongst the committee members through this process. And in the end, there was a great deal of agreement on the report and the recommendations put forth, which subsequently became H-466. Additionally, I will share with the committee that the agency has met with our colleagues at the Agency of Transportation and heard their concerns regarding H-466. However, it is our position that the agency first needs to collect the information and data as part of the initial registration and reporting process. Any additional and specific concerns could then be worked out during the subsequent rulemaking process. This will allow us to first identify those water withdrawals that may need a permit due to their deleterious effects on state surface waters and also those water withdrawals that because of their location, rate, or volumes do not need to be regulated through permitting. With that, this concludes my testimony and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
I have, I do have a question, um, a couple of questions that have come up and we'll be hearing later from uh, Ms. Folsom, Jackie Folsom. Uh, did you, did uh, anyone representing agricultural interests participate in the development of the rules or, or the, the bill, the language for the bill? Yes, um, Act 173 designated a representative from the agency of ag and skits as well as um, they agency of ag was able to appoint a committee member who represented i believe it was the working lands um sector of the uh um of uh, of our population and the person who represented that sector was um, a hemp farmer. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, I also got a question about the granularity of the data for looking at interbasin transfers, um, you know, using six digit code versus eight digit codes. Did, did, can you just say a little bit about the choice to settle at the, Six digit code level, which uh, maps out to very large areas, you know, full, full basins. Um, I think the concern yeah, I, was that if you wanted to look at more nuanced impacts, you would look at a more detailed map. And I'm just curious how you thought uh, about that choice. Yes, so the study group met on that issue and, you know, we did land at the the hydrologic unit code of six, um, which there are four, Vermont has four watersheds in that size, but there was concern that there could potentially be other transfers that um, impact surface water, either the donor stream or the receiving stream that we would want to look at. So the committee did recommend that um, the authority be given to look at water transfers between smaller watersheds if the agency be believed Vermont water quality standards were being um, wasn't in compliance with these standards. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator Campion. Uh, thanks, Mr. Park. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So the administration right now is is in support of this bill with a few changes. Is that what I'm I'm understanding? The 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 agency is in support of the bill. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. Um, any other questions for Mr. Crocker? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, and with that, thank you. So, uh, so on our agenda, Ms. Shonda, you're, you're listed as second, but you're here as technical assistance if needed, legal assistance, or do you, you don't have any prepared testimony, correct? I don't have anything prepared, but happy to answer any questions that come up. Okay, thank you. Um, and with that, I'd like to go on to um, Mr. Nelson, Jeff Nelson. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, I've got a little bit of a head cold, so I'm a little <laughs> congested, but um, appreciate the opportunity. So for the record, uh, my name is Jeff Nelson. I'm a principal with DHB, um, testified many times uh, before the committee, and you have my bio on file. Um, over the years, we've worked extensively with the Agency of Natural Resources on many areas of regulation related to water quality, stormwater, uh, wetlands uh, and water withdrawals. Um, through the course of my career, I've participated in numerous Vermont stakeholder processes as new or updated regulations have been considered. Um, with respect to surface water withdrawals, I've been very actively involved in this issue in Vermont since the 1980s, working on behalf of ski areas to develop projects that enable uh, development of sufficient water supplies for this important operation at our ski area as well at the same time ensuring environmental protection. Um, I was a key participant in the stakeholder process that ultimately 
led to the current A&R water withdrawal for snowmaking rule that Mr. Crocker referred to, as well as guidance associated with that rule. Um, since that time, we've been involved in numerous cases where such water withdrawals have been proposed and ultimately permitted. Um, so today I'm, I'm here. Keeping your interest. I'm sorry. My apologies, please go ahead. Um, so today I'm speaking on behalf of the Vermont Ski Areas Association, which is a nonprofit trade association. Uh, Molly Mahar is the president of the uh, entity and can speak to the economic impact of ski resorts. But needless to say, as our climate changes and our winters become more irregular, to say the least, having um, reliable snowmaking systems um, is critical to the continued operation of these. And at the same time, we need to make sure that these systems are operated in a manner that ensures protection of the water resources from which that water is taken. Um, so back in terms of the background here, um, back in 2020, um, I spoke with the committee um, and we talked about, um, whoops, I guess I lost my hand. Um, we recommended that a study group be formed to, um, you know, help uh, the state and um, regulated entities and NGOs and others um, think about how we could move forward with a more comprehensive um, plan for regulating water withdrawals, since as Jeff Crocker indicated, and I agree, um, there has been no comprehensive way to look at water withdrawals as a whole in the state of Vermont. Um, so um, as a result of Act 173, that work group was formed and I was um, very pleased to be asked to participate in that um, and um, was, um, I think, very uh, impressed with the depth um, with that we as a group looked at these various issues that Jeff went through in his testimony um, and the breadth of involvement from various stakeholders um, as, as we looked at the various issues. Um, I think Jeff touched on it, but one of the things that, um, yeah, the two things that, that stood out um, for, for us. First of all, um, it was very important that the existing program for regulating and authorizing water withdrawals for snowmaking be maintained because it's working um, and it's protecting the water resources and the ski areas have a predictable way of um, documenting their need for water, documenting the investigation of alternatives and obtaining approvals. Um, secondly, for other with water withdrawals, um, we felt that um, the, the two tiered approach of first having a registration program to understand the magnitude of water withdrawals around the state, um, collect that data, um, and then implement the permitting program based on what the data shows us. Um, so in other words, um, we talked quite a bit in the study group about whether we should set a threshold for water withdrawals for future permitting, um, but we ultimately decided against that because we felt that um, until we had the data and we saw um, what the water withdrawals were, what the uses were and um, how frequent and where they were occurring, that it would be very speculative to develop thresholds and requirements um, uh, without that data. So for us, that was a very important way to uh, make sure that that other uh, potentially regulated entities would have um, an understanding of what this was going to be and have an uh, ability to participate in the um, rulemaking process for the ultimate permitting. Um, so that um, I think was a successful outcome of, of the work group to basically sequence things of registration, collecting that data, analyzing the data, and then using it for the purposes of developing what would ultimately be the, the permitting uh, process. Um, we, you know, this in part, um, this whole um, effort and discussion was, was in part um, prompted by concerns regarding interbasin transfers of water. Uh, Jeff Crocker touched on that and, and we were very heavily involved in the project that was proposed, which was um, intended to, um, uh, link, if you will, the existing snowmaking system 
at Killington ski area with that at Pico, where um, there was a very inadequate, um, outdated snowmaking system that also was, was uh, overly taxing Menden Brook, which is the stream that runs um, by the, the ski area there on Route 4. And so um, what that, because um, Pico is located um, within the Otter Creek and ultimately Lake Champlain watershed and Killington um, within the Ottaquichi River um, and then ultimately Connecticut River watershed, um, those, you know, that, that uh, was um, considered Oh, and it was, um, and now is, a uh, transfer between two Puck 6 basins. And um, that, that raised some concerns of some of the um, participants in the review of that proposal. Um, and so, you know, recognizing that there was, in fact, no mechanism by which Vermont could look at um, effectively the transfer of water between basins, um, that was one of the impetus for um, looking at some kind of legislation. And as Jeff indicated, we, we looked at different potential thresholds, um, ultimately settling on the HUC-6 as the appropriate threshold for all any and all projects um, that would have to be reviewed, both in terms of the, uh, the receiving basin and the sending basin in terms of compliance with the state water quality standards. But then also importantly, on a case-by-case -case basis, where the agency saw a concern about a water withdrawal at a more granular level um, of watersheds, they would have the authority to um, require that kind of review. Um, and you know that was intentional because if you think about, um, say, for example, a water system, domestic water system where water is withdrawn um, from one source and then, um, you know, the watershed where your house is or someone else's a, a farm is or something else is in a, a different watershed, it would create a really challenging and I think not very um, necessary or useful regulatory um, challenge to sort of look at that as an interbasin transfer um, because the, the water withdrawal for the for the domestic system is in one watershed and your house happens to be in another watershed and that's where the water's going. So um, we wanted to have it at a, at a large enough um, scale so that it really was truly interbasin. And at the same time, if there was a unique situation where there was a very large volume of water being withdrawn um, at one location and being taken to another, um, that the agency would have the authority to ensure that water quality standards were met on both sides. Um, um, Mr. Nelson, we have a uh, question. Senator Campion. So Mr. Nelson, tell us in lay terms what exactly you do what you did in the Killington Pico situation. What is it that, that the problem and what was the solution that you all proposed and then worked out? Sure. Um, so under normal circumstances, when a water withdrawal is proposed um, for snowmaking, there's a there's a process that the ski area goes through in terms of looking at alternatives and demonstrating that the project um, was the least impactful alternative and that the requirements as far as protecting stream flow in the and the stream that you're taking the water out of would be met, um, meaning that you're leaving enough water in the stream, that the water's being taken out um, in, in a manner that's not adversely impacting that stream and, and, and so on. Um, and, and obviously then water, being, water withdrawal is being curtailed when stream flows naturally drop too low. But what the difference was, was because the water was being um, lobbed over, if you will, to a different basin, to the, to the um, Lake Champlain Basin where PICO is located. Um, we, in the context of the review under Section 401, which was triggered by this project, we did an evaluation of the receiving basin. So by sending all this water over to PICO, was that going to create an issue as far as compliance with the water quality standards on that side? So normally, you look at compliance where you take the water out, but in this case, because of the interbasin um, transfer consideration, we were asked and we did do an evaluation of the impact of putting that water in a new watershed. So um, the rate at which the water is being put in, the rate at which the snow melt would occur, uh, impacts, potential impacts on erosion to stream channels, 
and we're able to basically go down through the water quality standards and demonstrate that the the transfer of this additional water into that watershed would not result in violations of the standards. That was the that was the new additive that we did. It was not required by any state statute at this point prior to this bill, um, but it was done in the context of obtaining a 401 water quality certification, which as, as Jeff indicated, Crocker, <laughs> is not something that would occur in all cases. The 401 happened to get triggered in this case because we, we needed a federal uh, Army Corps 404 permit. But the, this, this um, loophole, I suppose you could say, if you will, would yeah. be closed because that that trigger of having to look at the receiving basin and its compliance with water quality standards would um, have to be met um, in all cases, whether or not you triggered a 401. So I don't know if that's in lay terms, but hopefully that's, that's helpful. Terrific. So that, that's really helpful. I really appreciate that. Sure. that. That makes it much clearer. Thanks so much. Sure. sure. Um, I have a quick follow-up question on that. And so can you say something about the estimated number of gallons that got transferred? I'm, I'm not sure if we're talking 500,000 or 50 million. You know, like I'm not, I don't know much about how much water goes into snowmaking. Um, well, it, it varies um, based on the year and um, the circumstances. Um, you know, the volumes of water used for snowmaking are. Um, certainly considerable, um, and if you you know look at some of the the larger resorts in Vermont, um, you know the, the the average annual usage is in the 300 to 500 million gallons range. And of that water, typically what happens is there will under the snowmaking rule, obviously there's lim very strict limitations on when water can be taken out of the stream. So what has happened is. Um, most of the resorts have constructed large off-stream reservoirs so that um, when the stream flows are um, too low and when conditions are appropriate, meaning those cold nights when a lot of snow can be made, that the water is taken out of the off-stream reservoir and used to, to make the snow. Um, as far as, I don't know if your question was as far as PICO specifically, I can't remember what we pre predicted or, or, or modeled the uh, um, volume of water being transferred over from Killington to Pico. I'm thinking it was in the 50 to 100 million gallons over the course of the entire winter season, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Senator Campion. Thanks, Mr. Nelson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So I skied Pico on Monday. Uh, on my way up to the top of the mountain, I noticed that there was this sort of I don't know, bright green, bright blue sort of coloring in, in some of the watery areas uh, under the ski lift. So um, tell me a little bit, if you would, about snowmaking itself. Are we, what, what is, is it water in, freeze, snow out, or is there something else that's in the mix there? I'm not really the right person to speak to that. I don't know exactly what you saw. So, I, I, you know, but yeah. typically um, the snowmaking process is, um, you know, high uh, pressure compressed air and water that are combined and, and atomized, if you will, through a nozzle um, so that it comes out as snow. I'm not aware of any I don't know if that might have been for some kind of a race or I just, I've been not yeah, aware of it. I was just curious. I just wanted, I guess my question, and I can certainly ask it someone else, uh, but you know, is there anything in there in the, in that process that we should be concerned about that then is going into watersheds? Uh, but uh, no, I mean, there, you know, there's been some experimentation that have been done over the years with using kind of inactivated, um, um, you know, sort of solids, if you will, just to help create nucleation um, for something for the snow particles to form around. Um, I don't know, but nothing that would be, you know, in any way um, harmful. And I'm not sure, you know, if, if any of the areas are using that kind of thing, but, you know, it's, it's really okay. in to, to help create a little bit of a nucleus for the, for the crystals to attach to and with no yeah. you know, chemical or biological changes or impacts. So 
Thank you. Yep. That's helpful. I appreciate that. You said flakes flew, flew in the snow? It was. It was a little bit, you know, but also in some of the, like, you know, when you get right on the lift, there's always something to slow you down. But then there it just seemed like a little bit of a non-nature, like, color. They usually the color flake for the blue for race for the races. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Senator McCormick. Thanks. Um, Thank you. First of all, I, I worked for many years at FICO, so I'm oh. familiar with your, your operation. Um, it's where my kids learn to ski. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, the issue of, of withdrawing water, Killing, specifically Killington withdrawing water, uh, goes back decades. I, and I, I am aware of that. At one point, Kellington was actually prohibited, or at least certain times of the year. February low flow, the term I haven't thought for years of time. Mm -hmm. During the February low flow, they were not allowed to, and there was some, they were, got quite exercised about that, because that's when they said they needed the water. But you just mentioned reservoirs. Now, that was an innovation a couple of years, it was uh, Okemo. Right in the middle of the Killington flat, Okimo came in and said, well, we're going to make a pond and we're going to withdraw it during high flows. And just have a, is that now a standard procedure? Yes, it is. Um, so that, um, you know, the water is taken out when the stream <laughs> flows are above the February, it's called the February median flow. And then when the stream flow drops below the February median flow, um, as it does naturally in, say, the Ottaquichi River or Roaring Brook at Killington, um, then no water can be taken um, and it's withdrawn from reservoirs. So in the case of Killington, um, they have a, a, a relatively small reservoir up at the Killington base, which is called Snowshed Pond. And then they're also able to um, have a, a, a pipe um, and pump at Woodard Reservoir in Plymouth. Um, and so there are restrictions on the drawdown of that reservoir, but that is uh, um, the additional reservoir source that Killington has um, for taking water and not drawing streams down below what we call FMF, February median flow. Now how high up is the site from which water is withdrawn? I, I don't imagine you want to pump it from the valley over Sherman Pass, my God. How high uh, up is it in the first place? So the, uh, to, to take the water over to Pico, the pipeline route basically um, goes um, from Killington, the Ramshead area over. There's an existing um, sewer pipeline that goes to Rutland City. Um, and so the, the snowmaking pipeline, which is actually above ground next to the sewer, and, the, and the, rather than you know, doing new tree clearing and stuff, it follows that sewer pipeline um, uh -huh. over um, comes out near the upper uh, upper extent of Pico, and then um, is plumbed into the the, the snowmaking piping at Pico. Where does it start? I mean, just, if you can just orient me. Um, I'm how, specifically, how high up Killington? Well, start? it's it's over on the Ram's Head side. I don't know the exact elevation, but it's um, the, the it basically ties into the existing snowmaking piping over um, in the Ramshead area. I don't, I don't know kind of how high up. It's not at the, the peak, but it's, I'm going to guess, two thirds of the way up. But it's up on the slope. That's correct. Oh, OK. Yeah, because I, I was envisioning it coming from like down on Route 4 or something. It's not like that. No, this is really an interconnection. So the, the pipe itself um, is a very you know, relatively short section of pipe because you had all the snowmaking piping over at Pico and you had all the snowmaking pike, piping over at Killington. And this is just a, a segment that connects them so that um, as water is needed at Pico, it can be sent over through that connecting pipe. I'm, I'm glad to hear about the, uh, the reservoirs because that was, when, when Okemo did it, that was an innovation. Yes. That well, and that's, so, well, it only works for Okemo. The yeah. topography no, that's, works for Okemo, but it will not for us. Yeah, that's been a, uh, that's really the, the current state of affairs. Um, and that's the way the ski areas have complied with chapter 16, the water patrol for snowmaking rule. 
Um, so, and you may have uh, remember that a few years back, Mount Snow built a new reservoir after many, many years studying um, water alternatives down there. Um, the the so-called West Lake Reservoir um, is um, the most recent one that we've we've had con constructed in Vermont, and um, basically the same exact approach of restoring the stream flows on the on the north branch of the Deerfield River where this, the water was previously <laughs> taken and taking the water now um, out of the reservoir when natural stream flows are, are too low. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so, so Mr. Nelson, talking about the reservoirs, so they're, they are uh, man-made reservoirs. Uh, do they end up though falling under some sort of environmental regulation in terms of because uh, critters move into the reservoir and if you withdraw a lot of water, it might be a problem for the things living there. What's the, what's these, the what, how strictly regulated are the reservoirs themselves? Well, these are, if you take, for example, the West Lake Reservoir, um, down in Mount Snow, which is the most recent one, these are completely off stream. They're, you know, they're not, um, you know, connected to any, any stream or river or wetland system. And they are, you know, constructed for the purpose of complying with the requirements as to, you know, limiting water withdrawals from streams during these winter low flows. Um, so there's no, there's no, they're not regulated under the water quality standards as far as the level, meaning um, the, the, they're constructed for the purposes of, you know, having the water to be able to use when the, when the flows are, are low, much in the same way um, you would have a drinking water, um, you know, uh, reservoir or, or tank that, you know, the municipality can use the water um, as they need it and then replenish it as, as, as they can. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. No, I wasn't suggesting that it should be regulated like a natural resource. Otherwise, it's sort of a catch twenty-two. Yes. You could, you could never have a reservoir and and use it. Yep. Okay. Well, you Thank know, you. I could say anecdotally. Obviously, these are used in the winter and in the summer. Um, they are they're full um, or being refilled, and um, I've seen many instances of of uh, waterfowl uh, landing on some of these, and so they can, you know, kind of make this little stopover. Thank you. So I didn't have anything else to say. I guess just in conclusion, I would say that I feel. Um, you know, having been in many involved in many stakeholder processes in Vermont over the years, this was probably, in my view, um, the most successful one. I think that we had a very engaged group of people. We had clear direction from the legislature as to what we needed to do. We worked, um, I think, really hard and really constructively to, um, you know, examine all the issues. And, you know, obviously we talked a lot about snowmaking this morning. But you know, we were talking about all the issues, all the different water withdrawal considerations in Vermont, and I feel that um, you know, as Jeff indicated, we had really good consensus on what we came forward with. Um, you know, obviously there are little tweaks here and there that um, you'll hear about, but I think that um, it was a it was a really it was a really um, great outcome and I feel that um, should this bill go forward, I think we have um, a really good framework to make sure that we, we fully understand um, you know, the existing conditions as to water withdrawals in Vermont and um, a framework for then moving forward with a regulatory program that is, um, that is tuned to what the data tells us and doesn't create a situation where you know, things that really don't need to be regulated or regulated and just focuses on where the needs are to protect waters and to um, provide a, a straightforward um, regulatory program um, that in, in many ways is modeled after what has been successful in regulating the ski areas over the years. So, um, I, you know, I wanted to thank you for, um, you know, setting the framework for doing this working group and thank you for the opportunity to to be on it and to, to testify this morning so that's that's really all i had to say okay well thank you for your participation sure. um before my non-legislative job took over i was able to get to a couple meetings and it seemed like a a very uh knowledgeable and productive group so the right people at the table really digging in and getting work done. So Absolutely. thanks for that. <laughs>
Right. Uh, with that, I'd like to go to uh, uh, Representative David Dean Veritas. The Senator Veritas as well. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, he served in the Senate. For Good morning, Mr. Too. Chairman. Welcome back to the Senate. Thank you, sir. Even though, even though you were uh, smart enough to flee to the House, <laughs> that's what I was told. Um, so good morning. Um, so you know what we're up to. We're, we, we're walking through, just trying to understand the thinking in the bill and love to hear from you. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, I served on the study committee uh, that Jeff has referenced uh, because back in 2019, and he's already told you the story, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, Killington Pico Ski Area applied to alter their snowmaking permit our chapter, my local chapter of Trout Unlimited, showed up at the public hearing because way back when we were involved with uh, what um, facetiously are called the snowmaking wars uh, that uh, the Senator from Windsor County referenced in his remarks. Uh, during the discussions that led to the permit agreement, it became clear uh, that there was Without the good will of the applicant to modify their permit, there may not have been a water quality review um, of that interbasin transfer. Um, it it um, it was um, how do how do you say it? It was a surprise to all of us that, that there was this void uh, in uh, the Vermont law. Um, and because of that experience of realizing that there's this void, a couple of us uh, sat down and started talking with the Environmental Law Center um, up at the law school um, and took a look at two of the holes in Vermont's water law. And that anyone who takes water from the surface waters of Vermont did not need to say anything to anyone that they were doing so nor take any steps to protect the ecology of the stream. And there, as has been noted, there's no environment review of interbasin transfers. Um, that led us uh, to approach the legislature to set up the study group that has been referenced already, uh, established under Act 173. And quickly, the act charged the study group with developing a baseline inventory of current projected quantity, location, and usage of diversions. And in fact, that is incorporated in 466. Um, the trigger of 5,000 gallons, um, it, it, it's not an absolute, but it's, it's a pretty good um, uh, stalking horse, if you will, for withdrawals from very small streams. Vermont is, uh, just, if you will, littered with uh, small headwater streams and 5,000 gallons a day uh, can do uh, significant damage to the ecology within those uh, streams. Uh, the committee was charged to recommend whether or not interbasin transfers of water should occur. And we, the study group decided that interbasin transfers in and of themselves need not do damage to the sending or receiving basin if there are review provisions in place, protect Vermont waters. And as Mr. Nelson has already said that under the provisions of 466, you essentially would have the water quality certification that tests the effect on the sending or receiving waters against the water quality standards. Uh, it's not like this is uh, uh, a free floating review and someone gets to set standards or whatever. They're testing against the existing water quality standards. Um, the third charge to the committee is identify whether the state should develop and implement a statewide permitting or other regulatory regime. And um, we, we didn't want to design a program or presume a program until we had the data from the collection of uh, water withdrawal sources around the state. 
because as I believe it was Yogi says, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so uh, it's difficult to imagine uh, devising um, a program um, in a context of you don't know. Uh, the fourth charge to the committee was to analyze potentially viable regimes to address unplanned, uncoordinated, uncontrolled use of surface waters. And that's why we went to two other jurisdictions, uh, New Hampshire, Minnesota, where in fact they have existing programs uh, to protect the uh, environmental integrity of waters that are used uh, for diversions for various purposes. Uh, just to see that, you know, could those programs work in Vermont? Uh, in fact, we had several experts in front of the committee who had a much broader perspective than just those two states on water law around the country. Um, and it went under the heading of uh, regulated riparianism. And I'm not going to get into that. Please don't ask me any questions about it. Um, but uh, we did explore various uh, configurations of how the state might um, um, configure a permitting program if one uh, was shown to be necessary. And then um, the fifth charge was, if necessary, propose legislative changes that may effectuate the recommendations uh, of the report. And um, that is represented in uh, H-466 and S-237 as introduced. Uh, as has been noted, there's a good deal of agreement to the provisions of the report and the proposed legislation. Um, the group uh, did agree that all significant withdrawals must be registered or we will still be driving blindfolded in our attempt to protect our public trust waters. I will add that at the conclusion of our committee process, all members of the committee were invited to file their own comments as a minority report, so to speak, on the report and the single letter received prior to publication is attached as Appendix C of the report for your review. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets was an active participant in the process, attending every meeting, there's no letter from AAFM about any findings in the report, legislative proposal about agricultural interests not heard from, about the inclusions, inclusiveness of the process, nor about any re outreach they did or did not do to the ag community during the committee process, which I will point out went from May to December with 10 meetings publicly announced. Um, there has been some discussion in the halls. I'm sure some of you have heard of it, but I, I want to point out that for an individual farmer, keeping a journal during the growing season and then reporting to DEC the following January, it should not be a burden. Um, you know what you're doing and you simply write it down and it's not something that's due during the growing season. As to road construction, and some of you may have heard discussion in the halls about that, their need for water should not be exempt from reporting for all the reasons that I've mentioned today and are presented in the report. And they too should develop a low water alternative use scenario. So their water needs and the river's water needs are both served. They at the very least should monitor the drought.gov site for Vermont. Sign up for the email warning service provided by the site and not withdraw in drought conditions without prior DEC approval. And for them to keep a journal during the construction season but not have to report to January should not be a burden. Um, by the way, um, I went up to drought.gov this morning and according to that site, as of today, 67% of Vermont is experiencing abnormally dry conditions. Wow. That's another impact of climate change, that areas of wet or dry will be discrete and regional, regional in aspect. 
Vermont has been behind the times on this issue. Other states have already put in place programs to address the impacts of these withdrawals and climate change places existing users and water quality at greater risk due to unsustainable use. And that unsustainable use could damage their businesses, their crops and the in-stream environment. I thank the committee for giving me time to present my perspective as a member of the committee, as um, a member of the Trout Unlimited uh, State Council. Um, that was the, the level at which I was uh, participating. Um, and if there are questions, more than happy to spend some time answering them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Great being having you with us, uh, former representative. Why is it that it's taken so long to get to this spot? I mean, climate change has been something that we have recognized has been with us now for a long time. Why wasn't this on anyone's radar 10 years ago? Well, uh, you, in some ways new, those of us, those of us that spend time in stream. Yeah. Fishing and being a, a, a wading fly fisherman walking the streams yeah. have been aware of these withdrawals for years. And um, uh, right, so I so that begs the question why did no, I, 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 I hadn't quite finished. Sorry, I'm, okay. I'm not as facile with my words as I used to be. Um, and we never knew what to do about them. Um, and it wasn't wow. until we had the situation where there was a gap in Vermont law about interbasin transfers to be able to put together an effort to try and address that issue and the issue of unsubstantiated withdrawals out of our surface waters, other than you know uh, home use and, and things like that. But you see a 10 inch pipe in a stream, yeah. you yeah. know that's a, likely to have an impact, but nobody had a handle or a vehicle, if you will, uh, for addressing that problem. This all came together and we had a vehicle. Got it. Uh, Senator McCormick. Thank, thank you. I have uh, some questions for the witness, but first I, I wanna answer the question also is that this issue has been on some people's radar for decades. And over that time, there has been a, an ongoing political debate in which the other side has referred to uh, uh, green sneakers and the environmentalist agenda as, as opposed to serious business of making money. And uh, if we're, you're inconveniencing that, then you're, you're not being reasonable. And even now, we've got the, the sort of denial light. Yes, it's a problem, but you don't want to go, go, go overboard. Yeah. But um, if I may just say, just I, like Representative Dean mentioned, about sixty-seven percent of Vermont right now is is yeah in abnormally drought. dry. Yeah, I mean that's <clears throat> normally so disturbing. Yeah. I mean I feel like we've had precipitation, like some serious precipitation. Well, you, so, you yeah. know what, Senator Campion, down south, yeah. We have. We're not in yeah, that that's state. True. Yeah, that's Yeah, that's right. Really, the, the northern two thirds of the that's state. That's right. That's true. Yeah. It's us southerners that, yeah, we, we've been inundated. And we're dead. Uh, I'm going to call you David. Right? Uh, and, yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, what is the, would you just talk about the various different kinds of withdrawals and maybe compare them in terms of? who takes how much. I mean, you got industrial, in particular the ski areas. Um, we've got municipal, uh, we've got private homeowners, we've got agricultural. Could you just talk about how much each one compared? And you don't need to know exact numbers off the top of your head. Yeah, well, one of the things, um, and this is partially in response to Senator Campion's question also, um, that um, our crop base is changing. We're moving away from uh, dairy. A lot of those places, a lot of those dairy farms have uh, constructed ponds. Those ponds aren't even covered by the water quality standards and they were put in place to be able to water stock and whatever. We're shifting over to a row crop um, uh, uh, agricultural activity, including uh, hemp, 
hops, uh, marijuana, uh, truck gardens, uh, whatever, that are all increasing the demand for irrigation. And at the same time, in certain areas, certain regions, the water uh, availability is lessening. And um, so that, that, that's one of the changes. The other thing is that um, a, uh, right now we have uh, a, a lot of water users use groundwater, but Vermont does not have a huge groundwater aquifer. Those of you who were here and went through the groundwater um, uh, regulatory debate uh, know that we have discrete, intimate little groundwater um, areas. And I think as more and more um, agricultural and industrial, particularly brewing um, uses on those discrete aquifers uh, occurs, you're gonna find that if you haven't planned ahead, all of a sudden your business is without a key uh, raw ingredient uh, in order to meet your, your to move towards success. So, um, you know, our economy is changing. So is the weather. And we put this forward to try and be prepared. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sure. Dean, so I have a question for you, you and you just touched on it. So I remember when we were working on this bill last year, setting up the charge to the committee, one of the parts of the discussion was, while we're looking at surface waters, how do we make sure that uh, regulating in one area doesn't just push people from surface water use to groundwater use or vice versa, so that we're managing both water resources in an integrated way. Can you speak to that at all? Um, the study committee, the Surface Water Diversion Study Committee did in fact talk about the relationship and uh, to groundwater and whether or not um, we should take on water, quote unquote, both groundwater and surface water. We decided overall not to because the groundwater statute uh, is so robust uh, that it in fact should, uh, at least in the experiences that we've had, protect the uh, groundwater. Um, maybe um, uh, Jordan or Jeff might be able to address that more from, <clears throat> excuse me, the agency perspective in terms of, you know, what the regulatory schemes are. But the okay. committee, the study committee was convinced that we did not want to, if you will, mix the two and that yeah. groundwater was robust enough to be able to protect that resource. Now we needed to worry about surface water. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions for uh, Mr. Dean? Right. Hey, I, I have one for the committee, Mr. Chairman. Sure, to, please. Uh, interview me uh, for my, uh, your, your confirmation for me as a new member of the Fish and Wildlife Board <laughs> be, be, before, before uh, you make me irrelevant again. <laughs> uh, okay, well, you're, you're on the short list. Uh, so. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm just I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, good. It's a good reminder. We have a, uh, we haven't done any of this year. We'll, we'll be acting on that before we go home. So, um, so uh, yeah, I would like to just out there all do today, but that's okay. That's fine. Fine. <laughs> Only education. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So thanks for that reminder. And if anything else you wanted to share with the committee before we move on? Uh, if you if you have uh, questions or um, um, you know concerns, please uh, get in touch. Um, um, I don't get up there much anymore, but I'm certainly available via Zoom anytime. Okay, well, thanks. Most of us didn't get up here much anymore for the last few years, so you're in good company. 
Um, well, you're, thanks you're again. Back in, you're back in your, your uh, committee room. I can see that today. Yeah, back in the saddle, starting last week. Um, all right. Um, so before we go to Ms. Folsom, I'd like to just do a brief deep tour back to Mr. Crocker, Ms. George, Ms. Chanda, uh, to ask about um, uh, trying to make sure that there's no unintended consequences where as we do better work regulating uh, in surface waters that somehow we increase pressure on groundwater, vice versa. Can you say something about the adequacy of the, you still want to, uh, of course, I'm sure you don't either, have any unintended consequence or sort of a loophole between these two or other. So what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Sure, I can take a take a stab at that. Um, the my understanding of the groundwater protection rule, um, when they're looking at the uh, evaluation of a, of a well, that there is an interference um, analysis that goes on of whether that will interfere with surface water would, um, as well. Um, so there is some redundancy. The groundwater protection program is a separate division from the watershed management division. So we um, we communicate, but are in separate divisions within the DEC, just to give you an idea of how we're structured. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so with that, uh, I'd like to go to uh, Ms. Folsom. Unless, uh, sorry, Ms. Shonda, did you have anything you would like to add? Um, just to thank you, Chair, just to add that there's already robust, um, as, as former Representative Dean suggested, that there's there's already robust regulation in both statute and in um, permitting program and rule for groundwater withdrawals. Um, the H-466 uh, before you uh, looked at some of those regulatory regimes to build. We didn't build this necessarily from scratch, but we looked at some of those other regimes to build an informed um, uh, staged process for registration reporting and then later permitting. So um, it's really kind of filling the gap for regulation in terms of surface water, whereas there is already a, a regulatory regime for groundwater withdrawals in existence. Thank you very much. Um, we just seem to have lost Ms. Fulton. So. See if uh, Mr. Weiss is coming in. Okay. So no. Jeff, Ms. Wilson's coming back. Uh, so uh, we're getting people reconnected here. Just a moment, please. She's in the meeting room again. She's joining. So here's Ms. Wilson coming back in the room. So I don't know if you can come on screen yet, but there she is. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, if, uh, if you could uh, tell us what your thoughts are on the bill and any concerns, et cetera, that would be helpful. Good morning. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing my internet off and on, so I may have to go off screen, but it seems everybody is kind of having problems today. It must be St. Patrick's Day or something. Um, thank you very much. My name is Jackie Folsom. I work for the Vermont Farm Bureau. Um, and basically, I'm here just to request, and I think that Ms. Newman and Senator Bray have already um, heard that there's a gentleman by the name of Justin Rich who is a Farm Bureau member and also is involved with the Vermont Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. Um, when this bill, came, and I must say, I really appreciate the comments from the folks who served on the committee. It sounds like they did a bang up job of trying to cover all their bases. However, after this bill left um, the House Natural Resources Committee, it came to my attention through a flurry of emails that um, they did not have any farmers come in and speak to this in regards to irrigation. Um, Vern Grubinger from the um, Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association sent out an email blast. I got several emails from some of my members. And um, 
they were uh, so concerned that um, they didn't know where the bill was heading, although we suggested it was coming into your committee. And they went in and testified to Senate Agriculture um, on behalf, uh, under the request of Senator Starr. Um, and so uh, they did a really great job. They're concerned about the uh, amount of um, the, the rate of gallons. They're concerned about permitting. They were they're concerned about having one more thing to do, which I, I know um, everybody is. Um, but they also had several good suggestions in regards to um, some of the things that might help them going forward. And so I've sent Ms. Newman the contact for Justin Rich and um, also a couple others and, and Senator Westman, Tony LaHoulier, I think is from Lamoille County and he is interested from Footbrook Farm to come in and talk with you all. And I think it's just important um, that uh, the farmers have a chance to talk and to hear um, the discussion on this and to, um, to have their fears um, set aside and to be able to tell you what their challenges and suggestions are. So that's basically, I'm here today just to request that um, you find time within the next week or so as you're going through some more of H-466 discussions to have the farmers in and uh, let their voices be heard. Um, other, otherwise, you know, listening to the conversation, I was not involved in the, um, in the meetings with the study group actually talked with Molly Mahar from uh, the Ski Association to get a better handle on it. Um, but I did not attend any of the meetings. It sounded like they were very well, um, things were very well discussed. But as I said, um, after this bill got out of House Natural without any, any um, testimony from farmers who actually were irrigating, um, there was a concern that they wanted to be able to speak with you folks and tell them uh, what their concerns are. Okay, I do appreciate uh, the fact that there were. Jackie, uh, Jackie, do you have a sense of what the concerns are? Yes, sir. You have a, okay, what are, what are, can you just give us a little preview? Well, um, one of the challenges was um, the, the and, and I have to back up and say, you know, sometimes in a bill this size and when it's been discussed, people pick out certain pieces and don't read the whole bill. Sure. So I think sure. from looking at the entire thing, I, I can see where some of their questions are, but I also know they're focusing on the 5,000 to 50,000 gallon uh, withdrawal and having to, um, to report that. Um, and that's one of the issues. The other issue that was, uh, that I think, I'm not sure it was Justin that raised it, but there's a concern with um, uh, having to buy the equipment that the, the uh, net metering equipment might be uh, expensive for them. And I know nothing about it. Um, so I'm, I don't want to put words in their mouths, but these were the thing that they raised in um, the Senate Agriculture Committee. And I think more than anything, it was the fact that they didn't feel that, that they were heard. And I'm not sure how yeah. that got dropped in the process, but I think that's just part of being, being in the legislature and part of the job. Is there lobbying? Yeah. Well, okay. Um, all right. Well, we'll certainly have people in it. Uh, I'm just. I see Mr. Dean's little, hands up. He might yeah, be able to wait. I'm surprised that with the Agency of Agriculture as a named party, right, that participate, that these concerns weren't represented uh, to the satisfaction of people that you're referring to today but we'll uh so yes. and i was Dean. too when i heard okay well so obviously something fell through the cracks in some way at least for right. some people in the farm community which is not monolithic so um thank you for that if you can send any names and contact information as you've already uh mentioned mr rich Anyone else, if, if you could provide us with names and contact information, we will invite people in and make sure we hear from them. Um, okay, anything else you thank want you very to? Much. All right, thank you. Um, I, former I, I do want to say yeah. that, um, that go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I did want to say that I did appreciate the um, the mention of the livestock uh 
I don't want to say exemption with Re Representative Dean in the room. I know when we used to go up to his committee, it was always he had a button up there, I think, that hit, hit, it was hit exemption for ag. And so we're very careful about using that word. But we do appreciate the fact that that it was indicated in the bill that livestock were still allowed to drink out of out of groundwater. So thank you for that. And I do appreciate the fact that there was discussion. And, you know, I, I, I think it is true, Senator Bray, sometimes things just fall through the cracks. And I'm just here advocating for some of the voices to be heard uh, in their own words. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, any good questions for Ms. Folsom? All right, um, maybe you could stay on, um, go back to uh, former Representative Dean, who has his, uh, his hand raised. Um, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, um, I, um, I had an interesting conversation with um, a, uh, a fairly large uh, fruit, uh, vegetable, fruit and berry grower uh, down here in uh, Wyndham County uh, yesterday afternoon. And it was about this bill. It was set up uh, for us to speak with each other, just the two of us. And um, one of the things that I, I will share with the committee is that he was unaware of what the Administrative Procedure Act requires relative to the promulgation of rules that it's not some magic wand that the legislature is, you know, swirling over uh, the rulemaking or the agency, um, but that it's a process. Um, the, the rule comes back to the legislature through the LCAR committee and that um, arbitrary and capricious is a standard that is applied at LCAR um, so that if in gathering the data from the registration of withdrawal sources, the agency cannot make a case in terms of whatever regulatory scheme they put forward, LCAR has the ability uh, to one, not concur. It doesn't stop the rule. I know that fully well, but it does make it less uh, effective. Um, and two, that they wander on back to their committees of jurisdiction and the legislature will step in. So um, as, as uh, Jackie has said, you know, things dropping down through the cracks um, and why would a, a, a third generation farmer know about the Administrative Procedure Act process in terms of rulemaking? He wouldn't. So um, it, that's one of the things that does drop down through the cracks. But it was an interesting conversation uh, uh, that we had yesterday. And uh, I just wanted to share that with the committee. Okay, well, thank you for that. It's, you know, it's, it's those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people <laughs> that are often very helpful to both sides, you know, like getting the path straight and, um, Senator McDonald and I both serve on LCAR, so uh, assuming we're both back here, which I think we're, we're both hopeful to be doing, you know, we, we would see this coming through LCAR and we'll have followed it all the way through. So thank right. you for that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know that, that both of you are on it right now and that, um, you know, it's, that will have a big impact on what the shape of any final permitting program looks like. I mean, this is not a done deal. That was the other thing that uh, it was hard for um, uh, Joe to understand, but enough said, thank you. Okay. Well, and I think that, that that's part of the issue here is that the farmers don't, a lot of people who are not into this program and they don't recognize this, this is the first step. I mean, when, when it passed the house, several of them thought, oh my gosh, this is a done deal. So having to explain, um, and, and as Representative Dean said, going all the way through LCAR, this is not done by any stretch of the imagination. And there's still a lot of ways to stop unintended consequences. But I think the, the people that that I'm representing have just, um, as I said, have just requested that they come in and speak and 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 are heard and are trying to understand the process, which as we all know, doesn't end today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Thank you, Ms. Folsom. And uh, now we're going to go to Thomas Weiss. And Mr. Weiss, um, the conversation has uh, got a little more in depth in the last half hour, and we've slowed down a bit. Um, you've provided written testimony, but I wanted to, if you could, in the next few minutes, because uh, the bell has just started ringing for Senate floor, just pull out any highlights of that to uh, make sure that we're aware of your uh, most important concerns on this bill. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is Thomas Weiss, resident of Montpelier. I'm a uh, civil engineer with experience in hydrology and water resources. And um, I realize I've got about two minutes. Um, you know, Mr. White, so let me do this. Um, since we, I asked Ms. Newman to get in touch with you roughly half an hour ago, and it looked like we were going to have ample time, and now clearly we don't. We will be taking this up again, and I hate to ask you to rush through your gospel testimony in two minutes. So with apologies, I think oh, it feels to me like it would be better to schedule you in on our next hearing on 466. Uh, how does that sound to you? That sounds fine to me. I understand that you need to get off somewhere else. Do you have any idea when that might be? Not yet. I'll watch the calendar. I'll watch the calendars and the agendas. So again, apologies that uh, we, things took longer. We don't want to rush your testimony uh, because I know you always do thoughtful, well-prepared testimony. Um, Get outside today. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for the compliment. Words. Thank you for the inv invitation and. Uh, when you schedule me, I'll plan to be there. Okay. So head off to you. the Senate. You're welcome. Right. Bye. Sure.